Okay, hey everybody. In this video, we're going to find the best parameters W and B for our linear regression model. So in the last video, we came up with this cost function. And really, for each data point, we have this term here. And so for the 1, 2 data point, if you remember, the data was the number of pats leading to the number of wags. So our model, given the number of pats, tries to predict the number of times our farmer's dog will wag his tail. And we know how many times the dog wagged his tail. It was two times this time for one pat. So we have our model's prediction, and we subtract what it should have been. And then when we square this difference, we get a number that gets larger the further our model's prediction is from what it should be. So this makes sense to use in our cost function. And we do this for every point because we're trying to fit our model, we're trying to fit that line to the data as best as we can. Now, if you remember our WAGS function, this is our model, it has two parameters, W and B. So when we plug in a number of pats, it really simplifies to just W times that number of pats plus B. So if we plugged in one, we'd have W times one plus B. And so I'm gonna do that now, but I'm gonna do it inside of our cost function, and really I'm just simplifying this by replacing this function call with its definition uh, and replacing the input inside of here with what it is here. So over here we're going to have w times 2 plus b and over here we'll have w times 4 plus b. Now you can see clearly that we have a function of two variables, our two parameters w and b, and we'll, we could pick any random number for w and b and when we simplify this we'll just get one number so our cost we can think of as taking in two numbers and spitting out one number. Now to visualize this, we can't just do a normal graph like an x and y graph because in, with the x and y graph, the function has to take in one input and put out one output. So we need another dimension of our coordinate system. So let's introduce that. <laughs> and this is what I've been working on uh, all this previous time. So a 3D coordinate system. Now we have this extra dimension z, and what I'm going to do is replace these axes with ones that make sense for graphing our cost function. We're going to try to visualize it on this coordinate system. Okay, so now we have the x-axis representing w, the z-axis now represents b, and the y-axis represents the cost. So for any pair of points w and b that lie on this surface here, will get a cost as an output. Now this is what every integer pair of w and b looks like with their y coordinate set to zero. Their y or their cost coordinate in this case set to zero. It's like a plane, it's like a flat plane in three dimensions. Now I'm scaling their y coordinate by this number h and I do that just for visualization purposes. So if I introduce some cost in their y-coordinate, you can see that we actually get a surface that's more complex than just a plane. Now this is the surface of our cost function for all integer pairs from negative 10 to 10 of w and b. So let's look at like 1, 1. You know, if we set w to 1 and we set b to 1, we would end up with this point right here. Now I connect all the points with a line in this grid to make the surface more visible. Really you can think of just evaluating the cost at a specific w and b and getting a single number out and that becomes this vertical coordinate of the point. So it looks like w and b values that are close to 0, 0 around here on the surface are also low in cost, and it looks like the cost shoots up for negative values of W and negative values of B, and it also does so for positive values of W and B. Now, it may not look like it here, but you can barely see that as you change B, the cost does have a minimum point over here, and I can increase the scaling to make that more clear. 
So if I bring up the scaling of the cost a lot, you can see that as we increase B, increase B, we're going to get less and less cost until we're right at this minimum point. And then if we keep pushing B while keeping W the same, the cost starts to increase. So there is a minimum point on the surface, and that minimum point represents the settings of W and B that lead to the lowest possible cost that we can get. So let's see how to find that minimum point. Okay, so we'll start by just picking a random W and B and plotting that point on the surface. So if I look at this head on, pretty much, as I change W, you see that goes in the horizontal direction, and I change B, you see our point goes in the vertical direction. And if we look at it from an angle, of course, the Y coordinate, or the cost coordinate in this case, follows the surface. That's because I'm plugging W and B into this cost function and it's spitting out a single number which becomes the vertical coordinate of this point. So this is what we would typically do. We would pick a random W and B and now we need to know how the cost is changing at that W and B. We really want to know the slope of the cost in the W dimension. So how much is it sloping here, is it sloping down or is it sloping up? And we also want to know the slope of the cost in the B dimension. For that case when, where, over here let's say, we want to know that it's sloping down or we want to know that it's sloping up for a small change in B. So once we know that, we'll know the direction to move to minimize the cost. And so to get those directions, like in our previous example, we took the derivative of our cost function with respect to its single parameter for our super simple neural network. But in this case, we have two parameters, so we have to take the partial derivative of the cost with respect to each, and that will tell us how the cost is changing for a small change in each of them. So we're going to end up with two functions, and here they are right here. So the partial derivatives of the cost with respect to W and B. Now, I write them as dc dw, or the derivative of the cost with respect to w. Really, I could use a curly d here for partial, but I just didn't use that character for my function. So this is the partial of the cost with respect to w. It's a function. It takes in where we currently are at w and b, and it simplifies to a single number. And you can see that number right here, negative 432.03. Now, I do the same for b, so I take the partial of the cost with respect to b. It's a function that takes in where we currently are, w and b, simplifies to a number, and that's how the cost will change for a very small change in b. So I have these two numbers now, and I'm going to draw some arrows from our point, and it will tell us the direction we should move in our w and b plane for the maximal increase in the cost. Now I'm scaling them by this number alpha, which is like our update speed, because if I didn't, they would be shooting off too large to see. So I just scale them down by a positive alpha, and a positive alpha gets me these vectors here, which is the direction of maximal increase. So I'm going to decrease this alpha a bit. And now these partial derivatives become our updates to each of the parameters that they're focused on. You know, the first one is how the cost changes with W. The second one is how the cost changes with B. And so if we alter W and we alter B by whatever these functions evaluate to, these numbers, if we add these numbers to W and B, it's actually the direction of maximal increase to the cost. So we don't want to add these numbers we really want to subtract a small fraction of them. If we don't use a fraction of them, we may overshoot our target. So I also want to say as a footnote, 
you don't have to find these functions yourself. If you come up with a cost function, many machine learning libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow will create a graph of your function and automatically differentiate it with respect to any parameters that you, you tell it are parameters in there. So we'll see how to do that in future videos. But it is, of course, also possible to find these partial derivatives yourself and use stuff like the power rule, which we saw before, and the chain rule. And you just have to be careful about which parameter you're taking the derivative of the cost function with respect to. And you treat the other one as if it's not changing. So this is a direction of maximal increase. And if I change w by saying, oh, I'm going to add a small fraction of the derivative of the cost with respect to w, you can see we're going to take a step over here. And we're going to start to shoot off of the surface. And you can see it's like we're, we're climbing this hill here. And I can do the same for b. So we'll move in that direction. We'll move in this direction. And now we're shooting off the surface. And we'll continue to shoot way up and up and up. And it will always, always increase. So instead, we want to subtract a fraction. And now you can see that these two directions are pointing towards this valley here of our cost function. So if I apply these updates, you can see I'm shifting in the b direction when I change b. I'm shifting in the w direction when I change w. And amazingly, our settings for w and b slowly approach a minimum. And if I make these run continuously, continuously updating our parameters, uh, and typically you'd want to calculate the change to W and the change for B beforehand and then apply it to W and B at one step. But it works this way, you know, as well where we're alternating, we're updating W, then we're updating B, then we're updating W and updating B. But anyways, if I run those continuously, we have found the minimum point of our cost function surface. So if I increase the scale a bit, you can see we're down here in this little valley. Now I can change W and B, their initial values by hand, and you can see our point kind of slowly makes its way to the bottom of the surface. You see it's changing in the B direction, following the slope down until it gets about here. Now once it's at the basin, or a peak, if there were a peak of this cost function, there's no peak here, but it, it's at this basin, you can see that the derivative, the partial derivative of the cost with respect to W and B are approaching zero. So our updates are approaching zero. And what you can think of when you use bigger models is when your updates approach zero, otherwise known as your gradient, these two things you could think of as your gradient of the cost with respect to the parameters. When they approach zero, that means you're at a maximal or minimal point of your cost surface. And since we're subtracting the gradient from our parameters, we're at a minimal point. And that's typically a good place to stop training. It pretty much the thing automatically stops training because your update is now zero, so you're subtracting a fraction of zero from each of your parameters. So we found the minimum of this cost surface, and that is approximately, you know, if we get rid of rounding, it's still approaching something here, but it's extremely small. We're not exactly at the best W and B. You can find the exact W and B analytically, but this approach applies to later approaches we'll use for neural networks. So I did it this way, but we're still approaching the exact best values for W and B for our case. So if you use 0.93 for W and 1.5 for B in your model, you will have the best fit of the data and your predictions will be as good as they could be given the amount of data that you've used to train on. So that's about it for this video. We started with our cost function got its partial derivatives with respect to W and B, its two parameters, 
and then repeatedly subtracted a fraction, you know, alpha, which is a small number. It's not zero, but it's just rounding to zero here. So we repeatedly subtracted a small fraction of the partial of the cost with respect to W from W. It's really how the cost is changing when W changes, and we're updating W by how the cost is changing when W changes, because it's all about subtracting a fraction of the slope of the cost for each parameter from each parameter. And that pushes us to the basin here of the cost. Okay, so just to prove it to myself, uh, I plotted the data and I updated the cost function to be based off of these variables which we can change now. And I've set them all to be equal to what the data was. And I'm applying our updates and we get 0.93 for W and 1.5 for B. So we found the same parameters for our model that get us the smallest cost. So what's cool about this is I can change the data and we can see the line change. So once I change the data, it's not going to really make sense for our pats and wags example, but we can see the line change. So if I move this point over here, you can see when the points all fall on a line, our model, which is a line, actually lines up with them very nicely. So that's a good sign. Um, and I can change this. You can see it kind of drags a line down with it. If I bring it up, it drags a line up. Uh, and the line will basically always try to find the way it can be closest to each of the points. So I can change this one over here. They can change order and the line will always try to find how it can be closest to each and it's penalized the further it is away from one. So there's a balance that it finds to be as close to each one as it can be. And we could change this point. What's interesting is if I bring this one close to zero and I bring this one, its output close to zero, we should get, uh, and I also bring the middle one about to be between the two here at zero. We should get a W that's close to zero, fairly close if I could fine tune this here. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. And the B is actually going to be half of the Y coordinate of this remaining point. So if I set it to two, the B I'm sorry, not half, it's about a quarter. No, not a quarter, sorry, it's a third. Uh, and you could work that out yourself, finding the optimal B and why that would be a third. But it's kind of interesting and it, it proves to me that this is working. So if I make this three, the B should be about one. And then we could do nine. And the way I think of this being three, you know, this, this Y offset being three is you have two things down here pulling a certain amount and one thing up here pulling, but this is only pulling one third of the strength of these two. And so you end up with something about one third of the height of this point. That's my hand waving explanation. You can solve it algebraically by finding the partial with respect to B and setting that to zero, simplifying and you should get B is equal to three. So it looks like it's working here. Okay, so that's about enough for this example. So thanks for watching, appreciate all the feedback, and I've been working on the tool I use to make these animations, so they should be faster to make now, and I expect to see some more videos in the future, and thanks again. I'll see you guys in the next video.